graduation test, son. I'm sure you'll do fine. Your dad and I'll be waiting for when you get home. The revelation came to me rather spontaneously. A second ago, I'd been smiling at the ceiling, musing that I was one very lucky pony. I was alive, for starters. I was alive and not down in the gloomy depths of a rainbow factory, shivering with fear and cold, pressed against panicked fillies and colts as I choked on the gloom and oppressive misery that seemed to hang about its perimeter around the clock. But at what cost? It was that notion, a simple, self-challenging question, which had brought about my suddenly feeling of insecurity. I didn't usually ask myself questions like that. It was safer not to think that way. Better just to count your blessings and remind yourself you were serving a greater cause, and to think about something else. That was what I did. Except that this time, I couldn't. My mind kept circling back to this single, simple question. At what cost? Deeply perturbed, I let my mind wander, searching for something I could use in defense of my reasoning. I was lucky. I was one of the fortunate ones. I had made it. I was better off than the ponies who failed the test and came here to the Rainbow Factory. The Rainbow Factory. The test. Flight school. Flunking out. I still remember when I stepped hoof into the ominous basement of the Rainbow Factory for the first time. It was dark down there, and I had been lost to something far past fear. I'd been petrified. Around me, like dumb cattle, my fellow flunkoats were herded from the cramped hallway and out underneath the large domed roof. The metallic tinge of blood, heated sweat, and bitter fear all came together at once to lace the still air. Distant screams echoed off the concave roof, mixing with whimpers from my classmates and the industrial noises surrounding us. I'd never known any place in all of Equestria with so many huge machines like this. The first thing I noticed was the biggest machine, cylindrical at the bottom but then tapering off far above my head. The stout top was surrounded by a gangplank that circled the machine once, and then divided in different directions. We were assembled so that we could look up the side of the contraption, up to the circular gangplank. Quiet! For a single moment, there had been silence, or more so an absence of voices as even our panicked whispers died. Only the loud clang of hooves on metal could be heard growing closer above us. We didn't know why we were there. None of us understood what was going on. And then, she appeared. Shut up! All of you! At the time, I had no clue of the gender of the trim pegasus above in a full body suit and hood. I just got a sense of presence, as if this pony's importance was a smell in the room. For a few seconds, the pegasus and the gangplank looked amidst the audience. She then had spoken. Her voice was rough and authoritative, but vigorous with youth. She had given us a lecture on how worthless we were, the lowest of the low, the failures, verbally beating us down like we didn't already hate ourselves or failing the test. I remember more than one Coulter filly literally falling to their knees in tears of fear and shame. The moment she pulled back her hood, I felt like my eyes were going to fall out of my head when I saw the cyan face. The flowing rainbow mane, the determined pink eyes, a single thought raced through my mind. Is that Rainbow Dash? Rainbow Dash the record breaker. Rainbow Dash the loved one. Rainbow Dash the head of the weather team. The pony who encouraged everyone to do their best and be everything that they could be and never give up. She was the one telling us we were worthless and should be ashamed that we were even born? It just didn't make sense. What was going on? As flyers, you're all useless! 
You couldn't pass the exam and our flock has no use for weaklings who will only make us less than we should be. But you can serve another purpose. You can help us fulfill the destiny that Princess Celestia herself gave the Pegasi a millennia ago. And help us to make rainbows here in the Rainbow Factory! It was when she kindly treated us with a demonstration of why we were here that my confusion gave way to the sort of fear one might feel when they were alone in the Everfree Forest surrounded by flickering shadows and noises, chilled to the bone and with monsters getting closer in the underbrush. I clearly remember the mood of the crowd shifting deeper into panic as one of our numbers was separated off and dragged away, struggling by a pair of hooded guards. What's going on? What are you doing? Let me go! Please! I didn't do anything! I'll take the test again! I'll do better! I'll pass this time, I swear! No! Get off me! Please! Some pony! Help! Spectra is pure essence of color. We Pegasi were charged by Princess Celestia to look after the weather of Equestria. But making rainbows requires Spectra, the purest essence of color. And you can't separate pure color from what holds it. So instead, you have to get at it another way. We were penned in by further guards as the colt was tied up with a set of chains that had descended from a pulley system above the machine. It was total panic, and we had to get out. But where could we run? Where could we hide? The hallway behind us had already been excluded from the chamber by a set of sturdy wooden doors. And even if we could get out, we didn't even know how we had gotten here. We may just fly around in circles until we were caught and brought back. I remember having to sit there, frozen in panic and despair, as that orange colt was pulled up to the sky, given one last chance at being off the ground. For a moment, he had stayed suspended over the machine, wings fluttering in a manner that projected his burning desire to get away. He'd been struggling terribly, screaming for help, screaming at whatever he saw at the top of the structure. It was the darkest minute of my life up to that point, and the longest. My jaw had gone slack, and my heart began beating as fast as that Pegasi's wings. I could fly out there. I have wings. I could go up and pull them free. I had buried the thought. It was something I got very, very good at as time went on. Ponies are full of spectrum. They're the best source in all of Equestria. But who would ever sacrifice ponies' lives for rainbows? No one would. Not that is, unless the ponies in question have no other function to serve. Not if those ponies are failures. Too useless to pass a simple flying exam to prove their worth to the flock. Pegasi are in charge of the weather, so unicorns and earth ponies have no place contributing to our sacred duty. But if there are Pegasi who are better off dead than alive, well then, who better to use for Spectra? So the best Pegasi engineers invented this machine to extract Spectra. But they found it gives best results when the ponies they extract it from are full of life. Colors are always so much more vibrant than when we use corpses. And then, it happened. The thing that both scarred me beyond repair and filled me with something stronger than hate. The chains began to pull their captive in all directions, splaying his four hooves and both wings apart. We could see his joints straining as his limbs were locked into unnatural positions. No. We find the machine works better if the Pegasi's wings and ribs are broken firm so they can't wreck the process by trying to get away. Sweet Celestia, this The chains began to twist, as if attempting to wring out the colt like a piece of wet laundry. Quickly, his haulers of panic turned into screeches of suffering as pain washed over him. His shoulder erupted in blood and bone. The chain had all but torn the leg right off. A loud cracking noise signaled his breaking ribs, leaving him looking very similar to a bloody, dripping ragdoll. His eyes stared in agonized helplessness as, with a hiss, the clamps around his hooves opened. He fell into the top of the machine where his convulsing body was ground down into a bloody pulp. (laughs) 
I was relieved when the screaming finally stopped. A humming had started up in the body of the machine, the turning of gears, the occasional puff of steam. My attention had been drawn down to the tube off to the side, filling with orange, viscous liquid. It accompanied six others. Red, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. The colors of the rainbow. After a while, and to our collective horror, three of the seven tombs began to vibrate profusely. Then gradually, a flow of according colors was spewed out into a dozen medium-sized vats. When the vats were full, a group of younger pegasi, about my age at the time, shuffled out from the shadows and took them away. What came after the demonstration was nothing short of a panic. The audience erupted, some flying into the air, others just straight out galloping for escape, all looking for an exit, all failing at the end. Soon the riot had been returned to order. Broken. Hollow. Welcome to the Rainbow Factory, failures! I think it was about that time when I realized that there was no glimpse of hope left for me. There was no hope left for any of us. I rolled over in my bed. My head was buzzing again, and my downy mattress had acted like a sponge. I was wallowing in my own sweat. The origins of my experience in the Rainbow Factory were nothing to be happy about. That period of time had really bucked me in the head. I gazed dully at the papers up on the wall of my bedroom. The tally chart. The statistics page. It all came to me in high resolution. Death had changed for me since that day when I first encountered it. It had become a statistic, something to be tallied and occasionally bragged about when you hit or exceed your targets. Seventy-four. That's how many lives I had ended by the evening I started asking myself stupid questions. The blood stains would no longer wash from my hooves no matter how hard I scrubbed. Or maybe that had been the case right from the first life I took. I had felt worse the first time, to be sure. It was easier to keep telling myself how good I had it, and thank the skies I wasn't number 75. Somehow... It had happened. I didn't die when all the odds were stacked against me. For weeks after my initial arrival to the Rainbow Factory, I was not picked to be drained. My jobs were many and gruesome. They put us all to work. Not every pony could cope with cleaning up the excess blood that would overspill as the machines ground up its victims. That meant transporting the filled spectra vats to the holding chambers. Worse was cleaning out the grate where the excess body parts that didn't get completely pulped collected. I remember once finding a pale purple hoof that ended in a protruding mess of meat and dirt encrusted gore and realizing it was a filly I had kissed. I recognized a small birthmark on the bottom of her hoof. She had put that hoof against my cheek and wished me good luck when we were in the line to take our final flight school test. And now I was picking what remained of her from a sewer grate. I threw up into my insides hurt, then wiped my mouth, took a breath, and cleaned up my vomit along with everything else. I told myself I was the lucky one. It hadn't been her finding my hoof after I got fed into the machine. When I wasn't on the floor working, I was in the holding chamber with every pony else. Ironically enough, it was because my containment in those filthy cells that I eventually ended up gaining my freedom. Let me explain. Though I've never been told, I imagine the reason why I ended up being drafted into the permanent working force at the factory was due to how aggressively dedicated I was to survival. 
amplified 100 times over due to the living environment. At first I fought only to defend myself and the food I was eating. They shoved meals in bowls, one for each pony in the cells, but frequently there were fights over food. Bigger colts and fillies shoved aside smaller ones or those who had been injured during the final exam. I let myself be pushed aside for less than a week before I started fighting back. I wanted to live. I didn't want to die. I wasn't the biggest pony in there, but the others learned to be wary when I came near at feeding time. But then I began to fight for the sake of fighting. I found that the longer I remained in the damn building, the angrier I got. Unable to take my rage out on the ponies who were keeping me there, the pressure just kept building up until one dreary day. I blew up at a younger mare who shared my cell. I had lost practically all my friends then, whether to the machines or because they have become frightened of what I have become. Any pony who says they'd remain calm and level-headed in that kind of situation is talking a load of bull. You don't know until you've lived it. I never would have thought I would be the kind of pony to do what I did. Not until I did it. I had started my slow change into a monster. I started finding comfort in harming others. It broke the frustration inside me and gave me relief from the buzzing, screaming tension in my head. At first it was minor fights. Throw two good kicks, maybe a punch or two. And then we both call it a night and retreat to lick our wounds. However, then it turned into something more along the lines of brawling. I'd approach the weaker colts and fillies and beat them up without provocation. Or I'd stoke up fights with bigger ponies so they'd let rip at me and I'd be justified in making them eat their own teeth. Making others suffer dulled my own misery. The ones who tried to flee, I wouldn't let escape until they were bloody and begging. I just kept upping the ante, raising the stakes higher and higher, until the one day I did the unthinkable and killed a pony. It was my first murder. I clearly remember how the fight went. I was working with another Pegasus on the factory floor, our wings tightly bound to our sides, moving some freshly squeezed batches of Spectre to the holding chambers. She had slipped on something, spilling the vat of indigo. I tried to save it, but it just slopped all over me, marking me as responsible for the spillage too, even though it wasn't my fault. The commotion would have definitely put me in the next line for the Pegasus device. The fact that after all this time I'd been killed because of a stupid mistake from some pony else drove me rabid with anger. Do you realize what you've done? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, <coughs> the weeks and weeks of my emotional suppression came out in one explosive event. As the filly got up to say sorry, I hoofed her across the face. She flipped backwards, landing with a sickening crunch on her left wing. Her screams for mercy fell dead on my ears as I began pummeling her. I used both of my rear hooves and my front ones to hit her repeatedly. She didn't even try to fight back. Instead, she kept flapping her forelegs at me ineffectively. At one point, her shrill screeching made me stop. It sounded very much like the noise that orange colt had uttered as he was being run out all those weeks ago. As quickly as anger had come over me, despair washed through me. Sweeping aside my rage with the realization of what I had just done, what I had been doing each time I started a fight, I was no better than the Pegasi factory workers who were keeping us here. Shocked and appalled, I fell to the floor. I'd seen the guards beginning to surround the two of us in a tight circle and covered my head, 
waiting for it. I wondered who'd fetch my leftover body parts from the grate. But death didn't come. As the minutes passed, I drew together enough courage to look up from the ground to the assembled pegasi. The overmare's vibrant eyes glazed back at me. I felt my heart contract as a cold fear settled in. Get up! Shakily, I stood up, willing my hooves to support my teetering body, which was covered now in bloody indigo. In Rainbow Dash's presence, I felt small and insignificant. What? What are you going to do with me? She responded with an answer I had not expected. Kill her! She inclined her head at the sobbing filly on the floor, but kept looking at me in the eyes. I looked back, willing myself to maintain the gaze. Her glittering eyes were stunningly beautiful. They reminded me immediately of the roses that grew up on my family's cabin, which I would pick each year on Mother's Day and put in a piece of pottery I'd made in secret. Before all this, I'd nursed dreams of being a potter someday. Maybe after I'd retired from the weather team with a nice fat pension and some nice fat grand foals. Her eyes' beauty, however, was confined only to those rings around her pupils. The rest of her eyes were being eaten away by madness. They were bloodshot and burning with something I couldn't quite determine. I was so tired, so confused, and so, so afraid that I could only yank up words from my memory to see if one fit. Curiosity, maybe? Pride? Expectation? Stress? Humor? Look into her eyes! Look and see the fear as you snuff out her worthless life! Do it now, and prove to me you're worth my decision. Decision? What decision? She smiled secretly, and then motioned with her chin at the sobbing filly. Do it now! She gave me the taser that previously clipped her leg. Use this, or can't you take orders? I don't have much use for ponies who can't take orders. They're only useful for Spectrum. I grabbed the device and switched it on the way I'd watched the guards do. It came to life with sparkling blue energy. The sobbing filly scrambled to get away from me, but I put one forehoof on her chest and sat astride her, using my greater weight to keep her in place. She struggled, eyes glued to the sparkling taser. She shouldn't have gambled with your life by being so clumsy. Didn't she know what was at stake? You did, though. That's why you got angry. You were willing to punish her for her mistake. Pin her down! No, 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 no! Put it in her mouth. It's the closest way to her brain. All my attention had shifted onto the heaving pegasus beneath me. I didn't say sorry. I was beyond sorry at that point. I could tell this was a test. I was not about to fail another one. I stared into her eyes, willing myself to feel nothing. And there, surrounded by masked figures, I prized her mouth open shoved the taser down her throat, and pressed the button to end her life in a haze of smoking flesh and the crack of an exploding skull spewing out cooked brain matter. I felt tense and uneasy at the memory of my first kill. I couldn't stay in bed. I had to move. I had to do something. Anything. Getting up slowly, I parted the lightly bloodstained covers, cursing myself for forgetting to wash my hooves as soon as I got home, and stumbled out of bed. I teetered momentarily and then stabilized as I found my equilibrium. I made it to the washroom and clicked on the faucet. Bringing my face down to the marble countertop, I washed the sweat from my mane and forehead. Momentarily, my world spun as I looked up from the sink and into the mirror. What looked back at me was some pony I never really got to know. Once upon a time, he was some pony who had wanted to be a potter, and given his mother flowers and homemade pottery. Now, I wasn't even sure who he was. You bastard. I attempted to stare down the other pegasus in the mirror. I lost and resigned to simply gazing hatefully at him. 
You've made me do this. It's not me. I wouldn't have committed these... These atrocities. You're not me. You're just who I became. It was a necessity. It was. The Pegasus in the mirror did not respond to my accusations, choosing instead to smile mockingly. His eyes... They were pink like rainbow dashes. No! I screamed, reeling up and shattering the mirror with my forehooves. Shards of glass flew by me in a flurry, leaving thin graze marks and cuts all across my flank. It's not... I caught myself in the middle of talking to the wall. Ugh! What am I doing? I have to get a hold of myself. This is stupid. I'm not going insane. I'm not. Yanking out a few large glass shards embedded in my hoof, I walked back up to the sink. Taking a breath, I looked at the smoothed chrome frame, the only thing that remained of the mirror. It was freshly speckled with my very own blood. I never liked that mirror anyway. A thought struck me. <laughs> Seven years bad luck. There, amongst the red and reflecting back to me on the metallic surface, was that Pegasi again. I would never escape him because he was me. He wasn't some pony I could stop being. Not someday. Not ever. I slumped down in defeat and rested my chin on the cool surface of the sink. The grip of sleep came over me soon after. A mere day after my brutal murder of the Philly Pegasus, and to the other captives' great surprise, I was back under that domed roof again. I doubled as a mechanic and floor supervisor. I remember how surreal it felt for me that first day in the field. How alien. A mere day ago, I was in the horseshoes of those I could now command. I ignored how they glared resentfully at me, and told myself I was the lucky one. You brought, brought your life with hers. hers. Shut, Shut up, up brain. brain. At the time, I hadn't been given the full body suits that the guards got to wear around, but I did have a white vest, trimmed neatly with yellow. My ID card hung from a clip on my collar. I had gotten to wear a helmet while doing the mechanic part of the job as well. Not only had my title as working pony changed, my mindset had as well. I was almost constantly craving for those feelings I had felt while standing over that bleeding pegasus. The empowerment. The satisfaction. The one time where I could have control over something in my dreary life. Even the revulsion I had also felt was no deterrent. Forced respect of the overmare mutated into outright admiration. She'd become my role model. Impressing her was the way to stay safe. But over time, I found her ways of total control very effective. She could disarm any problem with a look, and every single pony, male or female, young or old, was compelled by fear to obey her. I sincerely wanted to master her art. No pony could ever make me feel helpless or like a victim again if I could do what she could. As I settled into my new position in the factory, I found myself striving more and more every day to model my actions after hers. On the floor, I'd been ruthless, lashing out with my taser at the slightest falter and bucking those bound colts and fillies who were too slow. No, 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 no! To my sickening satisfaction, I quickly gained the reputation for being the supervisor to keep away from. This was success to me, a ruined concept of reality. I liked being feared. As long as I was feared, I was in control. And I craved control more than anything else. The next catalyst of change for me in the factory came in the form of an unexpected rebellion. A fresh load of flunkouts had arrived to be slaughtered and I was up in the workstation tuning the control panel for the massive, meat-grinding Pegasus device. The new load was like the last, and every other before it. Nervous, afraid, and insecure, 
I was far beyond sympathy, but I did have a strong concept of what was going through their minds. As Rainbow Dash, along with her representatives, arrived at the podium in preparation for the speech, I had stopped what I was doing to watch the show. Out of every other time that group had walked up to the podium, I remembered the details of this particular occasion the most. Firstly, one of the representatives had stepped up to base. By now, you have all clearly determined that you are not going into exile. There is no deportation. There never was. You are in the factory. You will never leave the factory. And while you may be called useless, that is also not entirely true. You are worthless to the flock as a pony, but you still have purpose. Purpose to all the ponies in this land far and wide. You get to help us make rainbows. Beautiful, magical rainbows. Doesn't that excite you? As expected, it hadn't. In response to their action, I grinned briefly. My attention was drawn back to the crowd as one cotton candy pink pegasus stepped to the front of the crowd. There was always one or two that stood up to the authority. They were usually the first to go, if only that pink filly had realized she was sealing her fate. Raising her head in the look of defiance, she shouted at the spokespony. How could you ever get away with this? How could Celestia or even Luna know about this and tolerate it? It's slavery! It's... Torture! It was a good question. It was a very good question. Had ponies asked this before? Had I? I couldn't remember. Leaning in a bit more, I watched as the spokes pony stepped down and Rainbow Dash stepped forward. After looking over the audience, she spoke up and explained in that rough, authoritative voice of hers. A thousand years ago, when Celestia banished Luna from Equestria and sent her to the moon, she was charged with three tasks. She originally was in charge of raising the sun and showering the land with rainbows. But with the moon being an additional task, she had to hand down the responsibility of rainbows. Celestia entrusted the Pegasi of Cloudsteel to make the rainbows for her from then on. For the first dozen years, we were given powerful unicorns to help create Spectra. Spectra is pure pigment, pure color. Everything is full of spectrum, but you can't just harvest it. You can never separate color from an object. So it was made artificially with magic! For a moment, Rainbow Dash paused to let her words soak in. A defensive veil of silence had fallen over the crowd as each and every pony registered the information. Then the Overmare continued. That is until our top engineers made a breakthrough. They discovered an ingenious way to extract pigment. It was so beautiful, even a simple machine could do it. But it couldn't be done with just anything. The conditions had to be right. Another pause. I could tell she was becoming excited as she anticipated the reaction following whatever she was about to say. It had to be like ponies. It is only in ponies where magic and spectra ran freely together. That was the trigger both for the catalyst and the captive pony's sanity. As that wonderfully brutal cyan pegasus laughed, gazing down at the panicked crowd that had now pitched into frenzy, a single pained voice cut through the commotion. I thought you loved me! Rainbow Dash's laugh had caught in her throat as she looked about to find the source of the volatile scream. When she finally located the speaker, to my deepest confusion, that invincible mare actually hesitated. Rainbow Dash, my role model. Rainbow Dash, the overmare. Rainbow Dash, the head of the Rainbow Factory. Faltered when she saw whoever had spoken. She never faltered. Not ever. What could possibly be different this time? For a period of time after that, I was too dazed to really register the entirety of what was happening. What I did get, though, was the orange filly who had shouted seemed to know Rainbow Dash personally. It was a bizarre concept, Rainbow Dash having a life outside of the factory. Yet she did. I knew first hoof. Equestria was full of tales of the elements of harmony, the ponies who had rescued the land time and time again. 
and the Rainbow Mane Pegasus, who had done more good for Equestria than any pony since Commander Hurricane. Intellectually, I knew I was some pony different outside of the factory, but it was nearly impossible for me to envision her outside at all. She was so much a part of the Rainbow Factory that it almost felt like the building itself would crumble if she wasn't in it. Did any of the other elements of Harmony know about the Rainbow Factory? I hadn't known before I got here. None of these cults or fillies had known, judging by their reactions. Did Rainbow Dash's friend know she was the Overmare? Did she wear a false mask amongst them? Was this the real Rainbow Dash, or was that? Which was the real pony, and which was the mask she wore? What snapped me from my troubling thoughts was the orange filly's retaliation. Soon after the demonstration, that same damn Pegasus, accompanied by what seemed to be a friend, rallied the rest of the flunkoats with a few encouraging words. Seconds later, the crowd erupted into the air, en masse, in a flurry of feathers. This was not unusual. What was different was the way they were coordinated. Usually captive ponies were fermented and panicky, but in just that small amount of time, the orange filly had done the impossible. A reverse of roles had taken place as the unprepared guards were attacked. They're escaping! Get them! Stop them! Get them back here! Get back here, you At the time of the upheaval, I and my fellow mechanics were mostly ignored, though I do remember having to defend myself on a few occasions of Philly or Colt made it up to our platform. As the uprising got further and further out of hoof, my colleagues fled in fear for their lives. I was about to join them, but then I heard Rainbow Dash screeching out a single command. Kill them all! I saw her take off from the gangplank to fight the turmoil down below. I felt a strong drive to go to my hero's aid. Even though I didn't really have any formal combat training, I was a good enough improviser and had busted enough heads to do damage where it counted. That hour of so of combat was gory and satisfying. By the end, my white suit had been stained a deep red. I killed many in that brutal battle. I'd fallen into a methodical and effective pattern. Defend, attack, defend, attack. Back and forth until the very last rebellious Pegasus fell, overcome by exhaustion and was trampled to death by his betters. At this point, Rainbow Dash had disappeared in pursuit of the lone orange filly. I remember standing defiant amongst the corpses of both friend and foe, wishing bitterly for that filly to be brought to justice. In the end, she was, disposed of manually by the Overmare herself. Rainbow Dash stared at the machine as a pumped out vibrant purple and orange spectra. She stared so hard and so long that one of her aides stepped close and might have tapped her on the shoulder if she hadn't spoken. Clear up this mess! Use what you can! Leave nothing to waste! Yes, Silverman. Right away! She descended from the stout top of the Pegasus device to meet me on the floor. As she approached, I stopped wheeling the Spectre bat and saluted her in respect. Purple liquid slopped about inside, staining the sides of the vat even after it slid back down from the edges. Stand down, would you? Her voice was liquid and comforting. I dropped my hoof. What can I do for you, ma'am? She smiled brilliantly. A few things, soldier. For starters, I'd like you to stop calling me ma'am. I nodded uncertainly both at the request and at the word soldier. Was that a nickname? Was Rainbow Dash herself giving me a nickname? Sure thing. Uh... I trailed off as I searched for the appropriate word. Dash will do just fine. My heart fluttered with honor. Of course, Dash. I deliciously savored that word on my tongue, reveling how it sounded. Better. 
She paused and looked off into the distance. Secondly, you did a good job this afternoon, soldier. When given the chance, you didn't flee. That speaks in volumes to me, you know. I look for your sword. I knew I'd choose right when deciding between ending your life all that time ago or keeping you around. She refocused again and I found myself gazing into those mesmerizing eyes. I'd like to promote you, soldier. Draft you into my core group, the Orchestrators. My heart stopped almost completely. Were my ears betraying me? Was I dreaming? No. It was really happening. I... Yes, Overmare. Of course! I had nice new private living quarters, and all the time I could have dreamed to spend around Dash. The days from then on began to fade together, blurring the lines between creating a walking hell for the new flunkouts and living in a self-induced one as the heinous crimes committed came back to haunt me in my sleep. I was too far in though now to do anything about it, so all I could do was go forwards. After all, I was one of the lucky ones. When I awoke, I was sprawled out on the bathroom floor. I felt groggy. The question that buzzed around inside my head was, what had happened to me? Shakily, I got to my hooves. It was then that I noticed the shattered glass littering the floor like snowflakes. With a start, I partially recalled the events of last night. I had shattered that mirror, and I don't remember why, but I'd been angry at something. Shaking once to clear my head, I went over to the sink and splashed my face. Briefly, I took note of the blood splatters across the chrome. It looked like fireworks. Feeling better every moment, I walked out of the washroom and into my bedroom. Once there, I reached into a drawer and pulled up my bodysuit. After I had put it on, I made my way to the metal countertop where my statcon was charging. Taking it off the charger, I clipped it around my ankle. With a small beeping noise, it came to life. I was set and ready to start my day. Leaving my room, I entered an elevator. After the doors closed and I pushed the basement button, I leaned back on the railing and waited out the trip. As the elevator began to drop, I felt sudden concern. A moment from last night flashed behind my eyelids. Me, gazing at my own rage-filled reflection in the mirror, and then smashing it. Concern turned to insecurity. Recently, I've been having a harder and harder time coping with, well, myself. My strange nightly activities had started quite suddenly three weeks prior, the night after I talked to the new flock of Spectra donors. Things had only gotten worse from then. Last night was the first time I had actually caused physical damage, though. What was happening to me? Huh? Oh, right. My frantic pondering was cut short as the elevator grinded to a stop and beeped. It was notifying me that I had reached rock bottom. Shaking my head, I cracked my back and puffed my chest out. The time to feel was over. I was the ominous orchestrator now. Straightening up, I marched out of the small space and into the long, narrow hall. To my left and right, hot pipes hissed and groaned threatening to burn any pony idiotic enough to kick close. In front of me, the domed roof of the Rainbow Factory vaulted against the sky, and there, planted smack dab in the middle, the Pegasus device greeted my eyes. It vibrated and whistled, pumping out a fresh load of spectra. As I entered the chamber, I got two predominant reactions from those whom I crossed paths. A salute from the factory workers, or a whimper, from the factory captives. I flew to the upper gangplank, landing gracefully by the grinder at the top of the Goliath machine. The last remnants of its recent victim were still being churned up. Bright green, 
The shade was like seeing a tree from above. Don't think about being in the open air. Remember how lucky you are to even be alive right now. Without even batting an eyelid, I walked around the Pegasus device and out along a protruding spoke to a framed hole in the wall. Entering the gap, I continued onwards until I arrived at a metal door. The door slid open and I came out onto a long hallway. One way, the direction in which I should be heading, led to a small conference room where Dash and the rest of the orchestrators were beginning their meeting. The other led to the balcony. If paradise could be created, it would have formed that broad ledge, positioned strategically so that any pony who stood on it could always see the land and the sky at once. I adore that smooth piece of cloud. Seeing the natural light at the end of the hallway momentarily made me stop and stare. I decided conclusively that I would visit it after the meeting was over. I may not fly in the open skyways anymore, but I could still admire them. And imagine. And wish. No! no! Ripping my gaze away, I turned and made my way towards the conference room. On arrival, I pressed a button. The door connected to the terminal silently slid open. So, you chose to come in the end. Good. Dash smiled. We were just about to start the presentation. Please, sit down. I nodded and hurried to my designated spot around the horseshoe-shaped table, marked out by a tented name tag. When I settled in, Dash nodded and began to speak. Now that we're all here, I'd like to start. For those of you who didn't know, today marks three months since the uprising. A few murmurs broke out. We rarely spoke of what had happened. Yes, the one where Scootaloo... Her voice cracked saying that name. ...rallied the rest of the degenerate flight school failures and fought back against our authority in an effort to upset the balance of the Rainbow Factory. She moved over to the wall and clicked a button. The large screen at the head of the table flickered to life. I spent a long time trying to figure out something that was bothering me. I brought the video feed from our floor's cameras that day. I'd like you all to watch it. Let's see if you can figure out where we went wrong. The lights dimmed and my attention was drawn to the screen. As the footage began to roll, I felt the twang of something deep down in my heart. As the events of that day unfolded again in front of me, I began to shiver. What was going on? My stomach clenched, and I felt as though I was about to throw up. Unbidden, I recalled something a pony, I guess you might call him a friend, had told me once. He had been one of only two friends I ever had in those earlier stages working in the Rainbow Factory. They had both died long before the uprising. One had been the purple filly with the birthmark. The colt was a pony of few words, so when he spoke, it was because he was telling you something very important. He had talked to me the day after I'd murder that filly, mere hours before the guards came to fetch me out of the cells forever. What do you want, Glitz? Sitting here all by your lonesome. Thought you might need some pony to talk to. Yeah, well, I don't. I'm fine. You're not fine. I am so! You killed someone yesterday. Barely slept a wink last night. And you're more jittery than a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. You're not fine. Get lost or I'll smash your face in. He had recoiled a little at that, unsure whether I meant it. You know, in the end, things catch up with you. With every pony. All the crimes any pony has ever committed over their lifetime eventually it comes back to bite them in the tail. That is, unless they make amends. When I didn't uncoil from my rocking ball, he settled back down. Make amends? Are you kidding? No, but I- How in Tartarus's name am I supposed to make amends for what happened? It was her or me, Glitz. Or both of us. Would you prefer that I was dead now as well? No, but I- Then shut up because you don't know what you're talking about. You weren't there. You don't know what happened. I was there. 
I was bringing back empty spectra vats with cumulus. I saw you. I heard the Overmare give you an order, and you followed it. You didn't stop pressing that taser button until Purplebit's brains were all over the floor. When you came back and didn't mention it, I got worried about you. Get lost. I'm fine. She deserved it. It was her or me. He had stared at me by then, clearly disappointed. You've changed. You weren't like this in flight school. Have you caught the memo yet? Everything's changed. We all have. This place changes ponies. Yeah. He had gotten up and then walked slowly away from me. I guess it does. If they let it. At the time, I had only raged at him. Now, however, three and a half years later, I finally registered his words. Was that what was happening to me? Life at the Rainbow Factory has certainly changed me, but were the past atrocities beginning to come back to ruin me? I wished dearly that that was not the case. Like I need to add being haunted by ghosts in the list of reasons why this place sucks. I shook my head before returning my attention back to the screen. I concluded that the next time I start acting weird, I'd catch myself and counter my behavior. As the screen died, Rainbow Dash faced us all. You've all seen the footage now, so tell me, what was our downfall? Poker Eyes, a burly orchestrator with a crooked grin, raised his hoof. The Overmare turned her attention to him. The guards were our downfall, ma'am. The revolt was something we were not prepared for. I think the problem behind it all was a simple lack of training. He paused momentarily. And again, nowadays, and only because of the revolt, we've incorporated new elements into our routine. We shouldn't have to deal with that problem again. Wrong and wrong. Rainbow Dash emphasized her distaste by pointing one of her covered hooves at the speaker. We've just been lucky that it hasn't reoccurred. I can bet you that no matter how well our soldiers are trained, they will not be ready to contain a problem of that scale effectively. For a moment, she stopped talking, choosing instead to look around at the 13 orchestrators in silence. Any other brilliant theories? Flaxen, a yellow mare with a tattered blue mane, lifted her hoof. She was sitting right beside me. They flew, ma'am. I looked over in amusement at the stupid pony. What a foolish response. I waited for Dash to ridicule her. She didn't, and instead gave Flaxen the time she needed to explain. They flew above us. This gave them the opportunity to occupy the upper ground. We assumed they'd stay put on the floor and missed the obvious, that they would fly. What's more, being smaller than the guards, they were faster, not to mention more desperate. We've had flunkouts try to fly before, and we've always stopped them successfully. But not as a group. They always tried to escape in ones and twos, so were easier to put down. This lot got organized remarkably quickly, so when they took to the air, we weren't ready for them. Exactly! Rainbow started smiling again, her eyes glittering in anticipation. And on that note, let me introduce you to my newest idea. A stifling pause. Billies and gentle colts, we're going to de-weight them. In the wake of her proposal, a wave the size of the Pegasus device smashed into me. My world swam and I was swept under. Was Dash serious? De-winging was by far the most demoralizing and humiliating thing one Pegasus could do to another. It was the one thing that always remained taboo. From the most sadistic killer the factory had to offer, to the most idiotic fool ever to push a broom, no pony took another's wings. We bound them, sure, and I'd seen my share of other cruelties, but this? De-winging went far beyond those things. Even I didn't think I could do something like that. It would be like turning someone into a mud pony or hornhead before they died. Couldn't we just bind their wings on arrival? No! Didn't you hear, Flaxen? They were organized! 
What's to say that even with their wings bound, they wouldn't try that again? What's to say there isn't another Scootaloo out there waiting to be a spanner in our machine? You! Dash looked at me. I'm giving you the honor of orchestrating this new operation. On arrival, Flunkouts will be bound, and in short order, their wings will be taken. Let them know this will happen, every pony. Demoralize them. Crush any thought of escape before it has time to grow. Her words jolted me out of my thoughts and into a reality even worse that I could have created with my mind. Me? I sounded like an idiot. You want me to orchestrate the de-winging? No, the pony behind you. She spoke so sarcastically that my cheeks burned. I was the last on the far end of the horseshoe. Behind me was only the door. Well... I started to speak but stopped. I was more than apprehensive. Well? Her wings flared in annoyance. Do you mean to say that you have no desire to run the program? Or are you telling me you can't cope with that level of responsibility? I caught myself. Of course I'll do it, Overmare. I was... I was just wondering where I'd be located, that's all. Her wings fell to rest idly again. I sighed in relief. As I suspected, I've known since I thought of this idea that you'd be the cult for the job. I think you'll do excellently. You start next week when the new shipment arrives. Thank you. I'll meet with you privately to figure out details, soldier. For now, meaning dismissed, every pony. I nodded and got up. I knew that I'd start screaming in hysteria or something if I stayed in the room for much longer. Pegasi always died with their wings on. Even those fed into the machine kept their wings. Whenever I fought some pony in the cells, I never took their wings. Bent them and broke them, maybe. But I never stooped as low as to take them off. I have some things to tend to. Gentle colts? Phillies? I nodded at the other orchestrators. I'll see you on the floor. As soon as the door slid closed behind me, I stumbled. My breathing was choppy and my heart twitched sickingly. Willing myself to walk on, I stumbled down the hall and out onto the balcony. When I arrived, I collapsed against the balustrade, exhausted and with only a half notion of getting back up. Lying with one hoof dangling over the edge, I looked down at the world. We were drifting over Ponyville, far below like colorful ants, ponies milled about, bartering, interacting, playing in the fields, all oblivious to the fact that Equestria's largest slaughterhouse was floating right above their heads. I felt the twang of something I hadn't felt in a long time. Sadness. I'm one of the lucky ones. I tried desperately to remember my life before the Rainbow Factory, but came up largely blank. I recalled a few details, but they were like splashes of color on a blank canvas. Something about roses, sitting at a potter's wheel, a girl I kissed once, a friend I had once, all fragments of a life now so thoroughly lost to me that my brain had let go of it rather than hold on and grieve. I realized with a start that I'd forgotten what it felt like to live in a normal society. I began to cry, deep, heaving convulsions that threatened to rip my lungs out and tear my heart in half. I choked on long repressed tears, set free now by the crossing of boundaries not even I had known I would care about crossing. I tased a filly to death when I was the same age as her. I kicked a colt's head in just last month. I cleaned up the discarded body parts of my classmates. Why is this bothering me so much? For minutes, maybe hours, I sobbed until I had no tears left to shed. Only when I had drained myself dry did I take a deep breath and using the railing as a crutch, got up. Hoof steps behind me signaled me to turn. Dash arrived out from the hall. Paying little heed to me, the mare walked right up to the railing and gazed at the horizon. A moment of unease went by. Had she heard me being so soft and weak? Life is a simple game. We become the game masters. 
We've set up a world inside of the bigger one and controlled every single thing that goes on. We became gods. She stopped and looked at me. I. Me. I'm a god. And those worthless souls down there and up here are pawns I can move around. She smiled and turned away from me again. My friend Twilight tried to teach me how to play chess once. I had to pretend I had no interest in such a complicated game. She has no idea how complicated the real game is. Or that I keep winning it again and again. I wasn't used to such a conversation with her. I just nodded, wondering whether I had fallen asleep after exhausting myself with crying. We played them well. They live their lives oblivious to what goes on up here. They think me a simpleton who only sleeps, eats, and cares about flying really fast. They don't have any idea about what I really do, what I'm really like beneath my mask. We've done well fooling them all. No pony down there knows the truth about the Rainbow Factory. I nodded in empty agreement. We've done a good job. It seemed like the right thing to say. You've done a good job, soldier. Look at how you are now and then compare yourself to how you used to be. A simple mortal, living life controlled by fear and instinct, living in the shadow of those that were above you. I've seen you rise up the ranks in the factory. I remember clearly the first day you arrived here. Do you? Yes. It was three and a half years ago. Your memory's pretty good. Now, think of this. Dash turned to stare at me for a final time. Her eyes became cruel. It took you three and a half years to make it here, but it will only take a second to knock you back down. I began to bite my tongue. I'm watching you, soldier. You performed the trials and earned your place here in the upper ring of power. However, that does not mean you slipped under the radar. My tooth punctured my tongue and I swallowed blood. Don't disappoint me. I have had enough ponies I care about and trust ultimately disappointing me. Are we clear? I nodded and began to back away, slowly making it to the door. Her gaze followed my every move. To prove my loyalty to the pony who most embodied it, indeed, who carried that element of harmony, I had to kill just one more innocent soul. Just one. That was all. What was one more life to me? It had been a week, and the new shipment of Spectre donors had arrived on time. One from the group had been pulled away to my new office for a demonstration. The title emblazoned above my door stated that I was the official wing remover. Three hoofs away, the small desk cam filmed my every move taking the footage and then projecting it up on a big screen that had been mounted on an unused ledge of the Pegasus device. I could tell that I was being glared at hatefully by a few hundred sets of eyes on the factory floor. Yet in all of that, the one pair that mattered was the Overmares. I knew deep down that if I could perform the task of dismembering a Pegasus in front of the whole factory, her suspicions of my loyalty would be dismissed. The guards had knocked the filly out during transit. She slumped, unconscious, in her restraints. A small bundle of white feathers and yellow mane. Her eyes beneath her lids were flickering as she returned to consciousness. The pegasus beneath me was strapped to a rotating operating table. She struggled against her bindings, trying in vain to get away, to break free and escape. The metal restraints held firm. Mounting the table, I grabbed a hoof-fitted saw blade and slipped it on. It fit surprisingly comfortably. Raising it high so she could see, I started it up. She froze at the whirring noise and whirling blade, shocked into silence. She hadn't seen the sign above the door, hadn't been Rainbow Dash explained to the others what was going to happen to them all. The filly's coat was pure white, untainted by the grime of the factory. A color that would now forever be lost. From beneath her downy chest fur, I could see her heart beating ridiculously fast. Forcing my present emotions to leave me, I allowed the familiar feeling of emptiness to creep in. It spread, starting in my head 
but then rolling over me to affect my whole body. Stealing my heart and stabilizing my breathing, I rotated the operating table to get a better angle. I had practiced only on corpses so far. This was my first live subject. The Pegasus looked at me through eyes, unfocused by terror and stupor. She was still semi-stunned. What are you going to do? I didn't reply, fearing that if I did, all my emotions would come rushing back and ruin any chance I had of performing my task. Slowly, I brought the humming saw down to the joint where the wing connected to the body. Her voice twisted into a pain-filled scream as my saw cut into her. The noise was shrill and packed with panic. Using every ounce of control I could muster, I forced myself to ignore her screeching as I carried on. My blade cut down further, easily slicing through skin, hitching a little on the thin tendons. They snapped back, allowing me at the bone beneath. The filly convulsed wildly. The saw jarred as it cut into the bone and went through to the marrow. Gouts of blood fountained from the wound, splashing against my apron and face mask. I couldn't take it much longer. Closing my eyes tightly, I pushed hard down on the saw, ripping through the bone and striking the metal table beneath in a flurry of sparks. I hit the button to power down the saw. Silence. Blissful silence. Confronted by an overload of pain, the white filly had passed out. If I was lucky, the poor soul would be unconscious until the operation ended. She begged me to stop as I brought the saw to her other joint. Please don't. It hurts. Please. She began to cry, and I felt my fascade crumble in a way it hadn't any time I had put a pony like her to death before. <laughs> Killing seemed so much simpler than slowly stripping away the things that made the basic fabric of what she was. What I was. How would I feel if the workers had taken my wings when I first arrived? before I'd had the chance to prove myself. Emotion swept back into me like a torrential strike. The world tilted. If it weren't for the fact that I was leaning over the table, I would have most definitely fallen to the blood-slickened floor. My will had failed me completely, leaving me a mere shell of my former self, cold and distraught. Yet still, I could not give up. I had only cut one wing. I had to finish what I was here to do. I reminded myself about the lives of hundreds, maybe even thousands of ponies whose lives the Rainbow Factory improved. Sacrifices always had to be made for the greater good. Clenching my jaw until it hurt, I restarted the saw, cutting into the second wing joint. Thrown far beyond hysteria, the little filly could only groan in agonized misery as she lost her second wing. With the operation finally done, I disposed of the wings in the nearby incinerator, making sure the camera saw. The wings were to be wasted. That was clear. They had to know that once they were gone, they would never get them back not by medical science or by magic. Then I brought the burning hot cauterizing poker down on the two gaping incisions in the white filly's back. A brief sizzle of burning flesh and blood flowing from the wound stopped. Making quick work of the bandaging, I flipped the blood matted filly over and wrapped her up laying down numerous layers of gauze around her chest and wing stubs. With my task done, I injected her with a solution to induce unconsciousness. It was amazing she wasn't already passed out. The red light on the desk camera flickered off. I'd done it. Falling to my knees, I threw up. I 
felt disgusted with myself in a way I'd never had before. Uh, I... I'm so... The words wouldn't come, even with the little filly asleep. I had never apologized to a victim before. This was new territory for me. I caught a whiff of burning feathers and threw up again. <coughs> Rising, I trudged over to the nearby wall and turned on the water. In moments, the high-pressure jets had washed away everything except my shame. The weight of the building around me pressed down like a dead weight. I could feel the heartbeat of every pegasus in the whole place, but not my own. I had no heart anymore. There was a mirror above the sink. I caught sight of myself, of the pony I had become. The last time I saw myself in a mirror, I had smashed my reflection. And this time, I just stared. This was me now. This is what I had become. I was assaulted by a memory of pressing a kiss to my mother's cheek when I was just a fool. I made this face for you myself, Mommy. It's made of cardboard, so it won't hold water real good. But next year, Daddy says he'll teach me how to use the potter's wheel so I can make you a real one. The weight of my childhood dreams made me choke up. I had not grown up wanting to be the what I was now. I'd had hopes and dreams back then. The filly I'd just mutilated had hopes and dreams once too. All gone now because of me and this place. This factory and the ponies in it had taken so much from so many. The cost was too high. The thought arrived fully formed in my head, as if it had been waiting for me to catch up to it. I was getting out of there. It was the night after the operation and the majority of the Rainbow Factory had been shut down for the evening. As I dropped towards the basement floor in the elevator, I couldn't help but feel good. The events that occurred today could not have gone any better. I went through the open doors and began walking along the hallway that led to the main chamber. At the end of the corridor, alert and on sentry, a suited guard prevented any notion of entrance or exit. Approaching in a manner where I would be heard, I cantered towards him, calling out as I got closer. Soldier, move aside. I'd like to get through. In response, he turned to me, cringing visibly as I walked up to him. Y yes sir He leapt up out of my way. I could tell he was rather confused as to why I was up at this time but I also knew that a lowly guard would never question an orchestrator's actions. I nodded in affirmation and briskly marched past him. In my wake, I heard the suited guard sigh a breath of relief. Passing at the door to my office, I continued down the hall. Its sole purpose in the factory was to keep the holding chamber for the soon-to-be wingless pegasi separate from the rest of the place. Soon to be wingless. Soon not to be pegasi. Pegasi without wings are not just earth ponies. They are less than that. They've tasted the kind of freedom that mud ponies never can. They're not earth ponies. They can't live on mere earth. They're pathetic abominations that spit in the face of Pegasus purity. These were going to be my victims as soon as the schedule rolled them around to me. I was going to turn them into those abominations. And I wouldn't be doing it for the good of Pegasus kind like when I used to feed fillies and colts into the machine. This served no higher purpose other than cruelty. How could I justify my revulsion when my hooves were stained in the blood of hundreds, if not thousands, of other lost lives? Not being able to justify it did not make it any less potent inside me, however. Maybe I was just broken in my head and heart. Maybe all the years up here had done major damage to me that even I hadn't realized until now. As I approached the glass chamber, I was met by a hundred pairs of fearful eyes. No pony was asleep for obvious reasons. As I typed the combination code and stepped into the room, the group of pegasi began to shiver uncontrollably. Backing as far away as they could from my shadow, bitterness spiraled up inside me that my simple presence elicited such a response. But could I really blame them? 
I am not here to hurt you. My voice echoed around the glass chamber. Silence met my words. I'm here to help you escape. They clearly didn't believe me. Heck, I wouldn't have believed me either. A grey filly stood up, her eyes shimmering with conflict. A pony with a silver mane tried to pull her back down, but the defiant Pegasus shrugged the hoof away. With a disgusted shake of her head, she began to speak. And why in the name of Celestia should we trust you? You ruined Crystal! She was our friend! The look the filly gave me was one of pure hate. An elected murmur of agreement flitted through the assembled captives. Crystal, the pony I had de-winged, had been used in Rainbow Dash's demonstration of the Pegasus device as well. My chest tightened of the unfairness of her hate. You shouldn't. I'm not trustworthy. What you should do, though, is follow common sense. Tonight, I'm leaving this place for good. Whether that be with you all or not. A brown pegasus with the leaf cutie mark wailed from the crowd. But there's no exit! Shut up, leaf! I'll handle this! Don't yell at him. Yelling would be bad. I kept my own voice low. There were no cameras here in the cells, but the walls had ears, and those ears were attached to ponies with tasers. We're all scared. The silver-maned filly nuzzled the grey one so tenderly that I revised my opinion of them as merely friends. I know you want to look out for everyone, but if you start yelling, they'll just get even more demoralized. I was class president, Silver! I was supposed to take care of every pony when we got here! Yeah, great job there! How many of our class are dead now? Two? Three? Or was it up to five now? Chimed a voice from the middle of the crowd. You knew Crystal was scared out of her wits, but you still let them take her! Dancer, that's not fair. You know how bad she feels about that already. Her feeling bad won't bring my sister back! It should have been her on that table, not Crystal! And if you think we can trust the very pony who cut off her wings and burned them up like they were old scrap paper, then you're an even bigger idiot than she is! Shut up, Dancer! You don't get to talk to Silver like that! Sweetheart. Murmurs rippled through the crowd. I felt like I was an extra who had walked into some pony else's story. No, not an extra. I was the villain of the piece. I'm not asking you to trust me blindly. I raised my voice more than I was comfortable with. It hushed the crowd, and I got a look at the pony who had spoke. A colt who could have doubled for the filly I had butchered. He was waif-like and thin, his white coat and yellow mane making him look even more washed out. His eyes, though, burned with an intensity that would have incinerated me if he had been able to. Then what are you asking? The grey filly glared at me expectantly. As you can imagine, we're not exactly eager to go with you when the last pony you took away ended up de-winged and then mashed up in that... that machine! I'm asking you to... to let me make amends. Amends? <laughs> okay, here's how you can make amends. Cut off your own wings and then go jump in that Celestia damn machine! The white colt scoffed and stamped his hooves like he wished the ground was my skull. Maybe then we'll trust you! Dancer, that isn't helping. Screw you, Silver! What do you care? As long as your girlfriend's okay, you couldn't give a flying feather about the rest of us! The silver-maned filly looked shocked and upset at his words. <gasps> That's not true! Why, you lousy- Stop fighting right now, or I'll take back my offer and leave without you! They all stopped in a tableau of expectation and animosity. My voice echoed off the walls in the empty silence that followed. Correct. There is no exit. There is, however, a balcony upstairs that an able pegasi could take off from. And here. I presented them with a small knife. I'll cut the bindings off your wings. To demonstrate before she could move, I whipped out the knife and sliced through the restraints holding down the grey filly's wings. She sat down with a bump, as if the news in my action had robbed her legs of strength. To get to this balcony, you need to know the passcode. I have the passcode here. I pointed a hoof to my head. Now, who's going to take a leap of faith and come with me? No pony moved. They weren't going anywhere. They just stared at me like they were waiting for the catch. 
This was a stupid idea. Shut up, Brain. Very well. No one- I will! The gray filly struggled back to her hooves. A twang of excitement ran through me. It felt strangely familiar. I will too. The silver-maned filly rose to stand as well. If they are, I am too! The whole crowd began to rise until almost every single pony was on all fours. I felt something flutter in my chest. The emotion was alien, yet at the same time so natural. I began cutting free the restraints, allowing them to stretch their wings and wrap them around each other in overjoyed hugs. I realized with a start that I was happy. I was feeling genuinely happy. Only one pony remained on the floor, the white colt with the angry eyes. Wind Dancer, aren't you coming? I can't believe you idiots are actually trusting him! What else would you have us do? You're all freaking idiots! You don't know he'll get you out! This place is sick! And so are all the ponies inside this place! You're throwing your lives away! Well, I don't know about you, but I'd rather die fighting for my freedom than die because some pony else decided it's my time. The object of this is to not die at all. I stepped over the white colt. He bared his teeth at me like a scared dog. Surprise washed over his face when I flipped my knife around and gave it to him hilt first. Here. If you don't trust me, cut your own wings free. Then you can do what you want. Come with me or don't. I'm leaving, and I'm willing to help any pony here who's willing to accept it. Slowly and gingerly, he accepted the knife, glaring at me all the while. With a few quick swipes, he cut himself free. How do you know I won't just stab you with this? I don't. I didn't elaborate. I just turned away and surveyed the rest of them. My ears perked, and I raised my chin a bit higher looking at the rallied crowd in admiration. Their wings were all free now. They glared back at me, loathing and distrust in their eyes, but I didn't care. Follow me and keep silent. If you're messing with us, I'll kill you myself. I stared hard at the gray filly. Don't become a killer if you can help it. The benefits aren't worth the cost. I swung open the door to the containment chamber. After the last pony left, I exited the room and made my way to the front of the flock to address them all. I didn't have to tell them to pipe down as I might have expected. They were all totally obedient. Single file. Keep nose to tail. Once we enter the factory floor, the alarm will most definitely sound. Do not panic. If you panic, you die. Keep close and follow the pony in front of you. Do not stop to fight. Do not stop to damage the machinery. Revenge is futile. Keep your hooves steady. Don't fall. If you fall, you die. One second of delay could lead to you all being slaughtered. The only advantages you have over the workers out there are surprise and desperation. Use your emotions. Channel them. You need to go fast. Keep your feet and do not look back. Even if ponies around you fall, don't you dare look back. Are we all set? Nodding all across the ranks. Good. May Celestia... Celestia! Ha! The voice did not come from an individual in my audience. Turning around, I saw Rainbow Dash a mere twenty hooves down the hall, blocking our exit. My heart sank and soared to see her. She was my hero. She was my inspiration. She was wonderful and brave and loyal and committed to keep the Pegasi great. She was also the pony who had insisted I rob other Pegasi of flight, even though it benefited nothing and no one. She was the pony staring at me now, like I was a bug under her hoof. After all this, you call on Celestia to help you? You're stupider than I thought! Celestia hates you! You killed and maimed those that worshipped her for years now! The stains on your soul won't come off now! You feel guilty and try to save a few who deserve their fate! Celestia, as you know her, is dead, soldier. She's been dead to you for years, and you have been dead to her. Forcing down a wave of fear, I made myself walk up to the Overmare. Uh, uh, uh. Not another step. 
The tone of her voice made me hesitate. <sighs> what are you playing at, Dash? Oh, you misunderstand. I'm not playing. I'm serious. Do you see this deck on? She pointed down to her ankle where the gold trim device beeped. With a simple click, I can bring the whole guard force down on you. You're strong, and these ponies behind you are desperate, but do you really think you can win in a situation like that? I knew I couldn't. I was so stupid. What had I been thinking? I had seen failed uprising attempts before. How could I possibly thought my attempt would be successful where theirs had failed? Some of those Pegasi had planned their escapes far better than I had. They hadn't had their heads so recently turned by guilt like me. They had been waiting for months, even years, and had still failed. Every fiber in my body willed me to just give up. My attempt at redemption was nothing more than a fantastical theorizing. Yet still, something deep down made me want to try. It's not a matter of winning or losing, Dash. Over there to you, traitor! I set my jaw. It's a matter of spreading your wings and trying to fly. You can't take flight from Pegasus. That's not how this works. That's not what this is all about. How can you bring honor to the Pegasi race in Equestria by taking away what makes them great? And for what? No reason except cruelty. No benefit to any pony. It's even more barbaric than I would have thought you capable of. I guess... I guess I didn't know you at all. Like you said, no pony on the surface knows who you really are. They think you're some happy-go-lucky prankster. They never guess you're the Overmare. I thought I knew you better than them. I thought... A clicking noise was followed by the slamming of doors. At the far end of the hall, flooding like spectre from the Pegasus device, guards began to arrive. Rainbow Dash had only been stalling for time, and I had played straight into her hooves. Her guttural voice rose above the commotion. Then fly, orchestrator! Fly to slaughter! She lunged at me, and I jumped to meet her. We collided in midair and fell rolling to the ground wings and hooves both beating at each other. <coughs> After laying a solid buck across Rainbow Dash's side, dazing her momentarily, I turned to shout at the panicked ponies. What are you doing just standing there? Leave! Fly to the upper gangplanks and... That was all they had to hear. In a massive flurry, they took off, flying over or running past us. On seeing the departed Pegasi, Rainbow Dash howled in rage and tried to stand. I threw myself on her, but with a heave, she threw me off and kicked me solidly in the gut. I flew uncontrollably through the air and smashed into the wall. As Rainbow Dash took off, I groggily sprang up, grabbing her tail in my jaws and yanking her back down to the floor. She fell in a pile, rolling quickly out of the way as I moved in to finish her off. It was all instinct. My body moved almost without me having to direct it which was useful, as that prevented me from having to realize I was fighting my idol. My hoof smashed the ground where her body used to be. Such was the force I used, it splintered painfully. I fell to the floor with a cry. Did you really think you could kill me? I'm like a god up here and you're a simple mortal. Why shouldn't I be able to do as I please? Without me, this whole place would fall apart. Using the wall as my crook, I pulled myself into a standing position. You, you're not a god, Dash. You can die just like the rest of us. Stop fooling yourself. Launching off of the wall and into the air, I attempted to ram her. She countered and spun me around, pinning me to the wall. Overman! I am the Overman, not Rainbow Dash. I sacrificed my own sister for the Rainbow Factory. I gave this place everything, so now it is my everything. I stared into her eyes, trying to catch my breath, Madness danced in those rose-colored depths. At this point, the guards had caught up. She turned her head to address them. Go after the others! I'll take care of this one! The soldiers moved past us and took flight, leaving the Overmare to finish off her victim. They didn't even question her. If they found the sight of her pinning one of her own to the wall with the clear intent to kill him disturbing, then they showed no signs of it all. I wondered how long Rainbow Dash had been mad. I suddenly wondered whether I was the first to retaliate against her since the orange filly, Scootaloo, had been fed into the Pegasus device. I thought you loved me! You have beautiful eyes! You have beautiful eyes! You have beautiful eyes!
Look what you've done! An uncomfortable pressure on my chest increased as Rainbow Dash pressed me harder against the wall. She struck me across the face, which dropped me to the floor. She bucked me again and then pulled me back up to the wall. You both ruined your stature and disgraced your overman! You had so much potential! I actually thought that maybe, maybe I'd actually found my successor, but I was wrong! I keep being wrong about successors. First her, now you. This factory really can only survive with me in charge. No pony else. I could see now that you wouldn't have lasted a day in my horseshoes, let alone a lifetime. I could practically feel her building rage. I had to act quickly or I'd be finished off. I didn't want to die. Not here. Not like this. As she screamed in my face, her attention took up by letting me know what a failure I was. I reached down and yanked at her taser. It held firm, tensing. I desperately flicked on the device while it was still wrapped around her hip, placing my own hoof to meet the vibrant blue bolt that had appeared. I felt a jolt as the electricity passed through me and into Rainbow Dash. Her grip went slack for a mere second, but it was enough. Taking the small window of opportunity, I wriggled out of her convulsing hold and slid between her hind legs, rolling onto my hooves behind her. The source of electricity gone, she turned to confront me, but I was too fast. Bringing both my hooves to the back of her head, I put all my weight into a kick that smashed her forehead against the wall. There was a wet, cracking sound, and she collapsed onto the floor. My front hooves, one burning with pain and the other shattered, were useless for walking, so I hovered wings flapping in small jerky motions to keep myself off the floor. Thankfully, they still functioned perfectly. I braced for her to retaliate again, but she didn't move. Already a pool of blood was beginning to form around her still body. To my utter disgust, I felt a shock of empathy. As much as I hated her, she had been the one who let me live in the end. She had, in her own twisted way, been protecting me ever since I killed that filly all that time ago. And again, in her own twisted way, she had thought she was doing the right thing for the factory. For all Pegasi. I half remembered some phrase from when I was a fool. Something about power and corruption. The thought slipped away from me when I tried to grasp it, retreating into the aching parts of my injured head, but I felt like it was important anyhow. Goodbye, Rainbow Dash. Turning away from the mess, I flew out of the hallway and into the main floor of the Rainbow Factory. <gasps> the sight of desolation that met me made me shudder. Bodies of guards and unarmed pegasi both littered the ground. I recognized the brown colt with the leaf cutie mark and half a dozen others. Their faces were twisted into unnatural grimaces. Their jaws unhinged in silent screams. Blood painted the walls and floor. One of the guards lay in a heap, half on top of something white and struggling. I launched myself over and pulled the guard aside to reveal the white colt. Knife still in his hoof from when he had plunged it in so deep into the side of the guard's head that the blade had snapped off. Bastard. You said... I took a few with me. I'll take you to... <laughs> he waved the broken knife at me like he didn't realize the blade was gone. He dissolved into wet coughing as the movement widened the gouge the guard had kicked into his stomach. Wet entrails glistened up at me. As I watched, a ropey cord of intestine slid free, leaking fluid.
The broken knife clattered to the floor from his lifeless grip. For a fleeting moment, I actually thought every pony had died. I was wrong. An echoey distress call coming from somewhere ahead drew my attention, and I started making my way to the far end of the upper gangplank. There was still some sort of commotion going on. I rounded the corner and saw a single thin figure leaning over another. A pony convulsed on the floor in a seizure, most probably instigated by a taser. The dead guard, taser still in hoof, was testament to what had happened. It seemed like the silver-maned filly had been taken down and the gray filly had got in the lucky shot while he was occupied. He had fallen backwards against an outcropping of metal that still held a chunk of his mane and scalp on it. I was both mortified and deeply relieved. The convulsing stopped and the gray filly crouched low with a deep, ragged sob that seemed to come up from so deep inside her. It was a sound as dark as space. So you're alive. We all thought that you were dead. I nearly was. Or that you had abandoned us in some sick, twisted game that you were playing. I could tell she was just trying to hold back tears. She looked back down at the dead filly in her embrace and her voice became soft and broken. Either way, you're too late. Every pony, they're all dead. Silver and I were the only ones to make it this far, but, but that, that damned guard, he was hiding behind the door and he jumped out on us. I never even saw him. And then Silver was on the floor and he was Stamping on her, and using his taser, and, and... Tears plopped under the silver filly's upturned face. I can't do this without her. Yes, you can. She would have wanted you to live. How would you know? She all but growled at me, hackles raised. You didn't even know her! We were all just things to you, not ponies! Are you saying she'd prefer you die here with her? Then choose life. I sighed. There was no time for comfort, and I was bad at it anyway. Make that life count. As long as you can make it, every ounce of blood spilt would have been worth it in the end. All it takes is a single voice to tell about the dark secrets of the Rainbow Factory. I paused to take a shuddering breath, realizing that this wasn't just about escape anymore. Maybe the thoughts had been inside me all along, and I was too cowardly to see it. Or maybe the sight of my hero with her insane head caved in had sparked it in my brain. Equestria needed to know what went on here. The Rainbow Factory could not be allowed to continue this way, stealing ponies as lives in all ways. We can still escape, but we have to move quickly. Are you ready to go? Reluctantly, the lone filly got up, nodding slowly at me. She planted a kiss on the silver filly's forehead and followed me. Hovering above the terminal, I typed in the password. To my relief, the door swung open. Follow me. Uh, please. When we arrived at the hall, I realized with a start that something was different. The lights were all off. Entering deeper in the room, the gray filly close in tow, I went over to the far wall and felt around for the light switch. After a moment, I clicked it on. The sight that met my eyes as the lights flickered to life made my heart skip a beat in panic. To my horror, the hall had been blocked off on two sides by metal walls. My mind reeled as I tried to comprehend. As if on cue, the door that the two of us entered in from slid shut, and we were trapped. What the... what the hell is this? You tricked me! The gray filly growled at me from deep in her gullet. It was a primal noise, full of grief and frustrated regret. I abruptly wondered who the silver-maned pony had been to her and wished I could have given her one more time to say goodbye and mourn before dragging her away. I was reminded with cold clarity that I did not see death the way any other ponies did, 
and it made me shudder. I didn't, was my weak response. I raised my front hooves up in innocence. I was beyond confusion. I'm going to die in here! The enraged Pegasus took an aggressive step towards me, and tears of anger began to fall down her cheeks, her voice choking with emotion. <sighs> didn't respond. I was too discombobulated to talk. Had I somehow confused the doors? No, no, impossible. If I'd done that, I wouldn't have been able to get inside here in the first place. What in the name of... I had been about to say Celestia, but Rainbow Dash's words floated back to me. I wasn't one of Celestia's ponies anymore. She was right. I hadn't been for a long time. Still... What an Equestria was going on. I wait. The voice, coming from a small camera mounted over the door, crackled in a pool of static. I wait, and you lose, soldier. That voice, it was impossible. Or maybe not. Maybe she really was a god, immortal and invincible. I began to shudder uncontrollably. My world blurred around the edges. Confused? Let me explain. Currently, you and your companion are in between two breach walls. Years ago, they were installed by the last Overmare as a foolproof if all else failed. I have to admit, this was the first time I actually got to use them. Those wretched Spectre donors you rallied really put up a fight this time around. Yet in the end, it was to no avail. Clearly all you've done is trap the last beacon of hope for me. <laughs> A sharp burst of laughter ripped at my nerves. My stomach twisted painfully in distress. I had plans to come after you personally for trying to kill me, but then I changed my mind. I thought to myself, why not kill him and the nag with him in one go? She's the last one, you know. Every pony else is dead. So you didn't save them. You didn't succeed in this pathetic attempt at a rebellion. I expected so much better from you. Instead, my best orchestrator has to die alongside the stifled moaning of the pony and a hook and kill it. You killed them all. And because of what? A petty concept of redemption? Did you really think you could escape and just go back to living amongst normal society after what you've done? <laughs> I think you did. You actually thought you could just leave this all behind. You thought it was that simple. Tears blurred my vision. My wings seemed to lose all power, and not because my injuries from the flight were hurting. I fell to the floor, and I just lay there. I no longer had the will to rise. I was only doing what I thought was right. I couldn't live with myself any longer, and... My voice cracked. Thin lines of moisture rolled down my grimy cheeks. I couldn't do this anymore, Dash. I can't do it anymore. There has to be a better way. There has to be some other- There isn't. Maybe once upon a time there might have been, but look around you. Think about all that rests on this factory. All the ponies who depend on what we do here. Would they understand if it all just shut down and went away? Would they be able to cope? Think about the way equestrian society works, you pathetic disgrace for an orchestrator. They need the Rainbow Factory. They need us. But... You're an idiot you think otherwise, just like all the other idiots I've put down for even trying half of what you did today. None of you understand. None of you. You're what's wrong with the world today. Not me. Not this place. You. All of you. <laughs> Her laughter made my skin crawl. This was wrong. Everything was wrong, or had gone wrong. I'm going to enjoy watching you die, you sniveling disgrace. A hissing noise. I looked around frantically. So did the gray filly beside me. She stood tall, but I could see that she was trembling with a combination of fear and fatigue. Do you hear that? I think you do. As we speak, the oxygen... 
oxygen is being drained from the room. Why don't you pray to Celestia? We'll see whether she cares enough to answer. <laughs> With a resolute click, the audio cut. Already black dots were spreading to consume my vision, and the air in my throat felt thick and syrupy. I ran at the door, stumbling on my bloodied hooves, and bucked. A hollow knell rang out, but it did exactly nothing except split my hoof down to the bone. I gave a ragged cry of frustration and agony. Turning my heavy head to the gray filly, I motioned for her to come to my side. At least I could die alongside a pony who hadn't been corrupted by the factory. A pony that who lived amongst the society that, even now, I crave to return to. She shied away from me. Do you... do you have a plan to get out of here? My gesturing hoof froze. What should I tell her? She was staring at me. All big green eyes and trembling legs. She couldn't be very old under all that grime. Unicorn and Earth Pony fillies her age didn't have to worry about dying up in the sky, in the one place where wings couldn't fly you to freedom. Hers were neatly folded at her sides. If I had just done my job the way I was supposed to, I would have cut those off. I would have heard her screaming and begging me to stop, and then I would have watched the Pegasus device grind her up and spit her out as Spectra, so the pretty little innocent Unicorn and Earth Pony fillies down on the ground could have sunny days to grow up and grow old in. This gray filly would never grow up. She would never grow old. Neither would I. I had failed. Abruptly, she stumbled towards me, shoving me aside to turn and launched her tiny hind legs at the door. She kicked again and again, grunting and shouting wordlessly, desperation dumping one last blast of adrenaline into her system didn't take long for her to have to stop. She was too small, too weak to break through. The hissing of emptying air continued. I should have tried sooner. What? I should have tried to get out sooner. I shouldn't have stayed for so long. I thought I was doing the right thing. Or, no, I was too scared. I was always too scared. I was selfish, scared only for myself. I did such terrible things, all because I was too scared not to. But that's not an excuse. And then I was too late. I should have tried harder. I should have said no sooner, before it all got this far. She didn't try to comfort me as my tears fell. Why would she? As far as she was concerned, I was part of the reason she was in this mess. Yeah. You should have. I'm sorry. I turned my face aside and stepped away from her. Shame inside me so hot it burned. It means nothing now, but I'm truly, truly sorry. We're... We're really going to die in here, aren't we? I didn't answer. I didn't need to. I... I don't want to die. Please, you can't let me die. You said you'd save me. You said you'd protect me. You were supposed to get me out. I'm sorry. Flop down, legs giving way about the halfway point, abruptly graceless and panting. I stepped towards her, but I stumbled and fell. I tried to crawl towards her, but my muscles were laden. I heard her whimpering as my vision grayed and dimmed. Don't be afraid. It will be over soon. There are worse ways to go. It's just... D j just like going to sleep. My mouth wasn't working right. I sounded like I was drunk. The black dots became frenzied and my vision died altogether. The tip of my forehoof touched something. I hoped it was the foreleg I had been aiming for. I hoped she got some comfort from it. I... I want my mommy! What... what is it? 
What's your name? I should know her name. It was wrong of her to die without anyone knowing her name or caring who she was. I struggled to hang on to my remaining senses. Starlight! Starlight! I couldn't smell my own blood anymore. My mouth was made of cotton wool. Only two noises remained. The deep clanking of the Rainbow Factory one story below and the ever-present static. I'm... I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs>